Good morning. It's Tuesday, the 3rd of September, and this is Govind Raj at Raj headquartered and broadcasting as well as streaming from Mumbai, India's financial capital. Once again, it's raining away. The take. Securities and Exchange Board of India Chairperson Madhubi Puri Bhuch is back in the news cycle after the Congress party alleged with seeming evidence that she was earning a fairly substantial income in the form of a salary from ICICI Bank, an organization she parted ways with almost a decade ago, despite now being a whole-time member on the SEBI board, which is that she was earning a salary while she was a whole-time member on the Securities and Exchange Board of India board, which obviously contravenes a whole bunch of regulations. Now, ICICI Bank came back later in the day yesterday to say that they had not paid any salary or granted any employee stock options to her after her retirement and other than her retiral benefits since she superannuated in October 2013. ICICI Bank said specifically that Ms. Butch received compensation in the form of salary, retiral benefits, bonus and ESOPs in line with their applicable policies and under the bank's ESOP rules, those ESOPs vest over the next few years from the date of allotment, which is specifically 10 years. That includes retired employees who have the choice of exercising their ESOPs up to 10 years from the date of vesting. Now, I'm sensing people are going to nitpick further on this, but it is quite logical that there had to be a simpler explanation to the allegations made. Now, the nitpicking will also link to whether and if ICICI Bank was given more lenient treatment in its own merger with ICICI Securities, a subsidiary in which ICICI Bank owned about 75%. Specifically, ICICI Bank did not have to go through a price discovery process, which ICICI Securities shareholders felt they had been shortchanged out of, including quantum mutual funds Ajit Dayal, who appeared on the core report on this specific matter a few months ago. Now, I do feel that the Congress party knew about Ms. Butch's income and the likelihood of it going back to her old stint but found a good opportunity to fling something and bring back some attention to the larger issue of Adani's cases and the Hindenburg report, which has evidently died down. Now, it does appear at this point that events, including the political back and forth that has ensued, are running ahead and faster than perhaps what the former ICICI bank executive, even if somewhat battle-hardened in recent years, can stomach, having not been a politician. And that's, of course, my guess. But that, unfortunately, is also the price to pay for occupying public office. Equally and equally unfortunately, this also goes back to the point that the SEBI chairperson has not issued a line-by-line public disclosure on her income in the last decade or the manner of her dealings, if any, with issues involving the Adani group. It's very likely that she's followed the law to a T and recused herself from meetings where there could have been a perceived conflict, but that is my conjecture. Till she makes a clean public statement, she will continue to face repeated allegations, including of the likes we saw yesterday. Some may have a simple and logical response, others may not. The only way out is to take the issue head on and not run from it, even if there is a sense of assured protection in keeping silent. And that brings us to the top stories of the day. India's longest ever stock market rally continues, enters the 13th day. The operational dynamics of the Air India Vistara merger with fresh insights. Share of Russian crude in India's oil basket continues to fall. And the Volkswagen says it may close more plants, blaming the move on a tough economic environment in Germany. This is a core report with Govind Raj Ethiraj. The bull run continues. The Nifty 50 climbed for the 13th consecutive session on Monday, its longest ever rally, continuing to be powered by rising information technology stocks as well as consumer goods companies' stocks. Indices hit a record high yesterday. A potential interest rate cut this month by the Federal Reserve is still keeping markets going, particularly IT stocks, because that could mean more business for them in the United States. And back home, the monsoons have been stronger, even if too strong, and that's helping consumer product companies. The BSE Sensex closed up 194 points to 82,559 and hit an all-time high of 82,725 during intraday trade yesterday. The Nifty closed at 25,278, up 43 points after hitting an all-time high of 25,333 again during intraday trade on Monday. Elsewhere, not surprisingly, a Securities and Exchange Board of India study showed that investors in public issues sold 54% of shares within a week of listing. Now, that was the period between April 2021 and December 2023. Shares of 144 companies were listed during the period to raise about 2.13 trillion rupees, that's 213,000 crores or about $25 billion, with three-fourths 
of these IPOs delivering positive returns, SEBI said. The timelines, of course, are a little old and SEBI would do well to update these figures to perhaps even last month because I'm sensing that the IPO markets went even more wild in this calendar year. Oil holds below $77. Russian crude oil share in India drops. Oil prices seesawed as traders weighed a planned production increase from the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries next month, economic headwinds in China and lower output in Libya, according to Bloomberg. Brent crude prices were holding under $77 a barrel after losing more than 2% on Friday. The OPEC and its allies are set to add about 180,000 barrels a day as they gradually restore production that's been halted since 2022, according to delegates involved in the discussions, reported Bloomberg. Latest China data revealed factory activity contracting for a fourth month in August, even as its residential slump deepened. China is the world's largest crude importer. India's diesel sales also registered a sharp decline last month, according to Bloomberg. Meanwhile, Business Standard is reporting that shipments of Russian oil to India declined by 14% in August from July after a prolific run of three months of near-record purchases by Indian refiners after Russian traders refused to offer higher discounts, according to industry sources and ship tracking data. Iraq, India's biggest oil supplier prior to Russia's inroads, improved its market share in India, and I'll come to that, at the expense of Russia on the back of lower rates. But did you know that Iraq was India's biggest oil supplier earlier? Anyway, the share of Russian oil in India's crude basket also dipped by more than 3 percentage points in August from July at below 40%, according to, once again, business standard calculations. So here's a quick breakdown of who we import our crude from as of now. So Russia still leads with 40% share, followed by Iraq at 19% and Saudi Arabia at 12%. The United Arab Emirates, and maybe you would have not guessed this, the United States are both at 9%. India's manufacturing activity slows. India's manufacturing activity eased to a three-month low in August as demand softened significantly, according to an HSBC survey that was released on Monday. So, as you know, GDP growth in India has slowed to 6.7% last quarter from 7.8% the previous year as government spending fell, according to data that was released on Friday last week. So the HSBC Final India Manufacturing Purchasing Managers Index, compiled by SNB Global, fell for the second month in August, dropping to 57.5 from July's 58.1, below a preliminary estimate of 57.9, Reuters reported. How will the Air India and Vistara merger look? A 92-year-old airline will soon merge with a 9-year-old one. That's how it looks from the outside. What could it be from the inside? Since most listeners here have likely travelled either Air India or Vistara, I'm sure you would like to know more about how this merger will pan out operationally. What happens to counter staff, supervisory staff, ground crew and of course in-flight? Now, there are some insights emerging on how this could evolve. The bottom line is it does look like a 5-6 to six month active transition period during which I anticipate much consumer angst. But it'll also depend on how well the airlines, or at least Air India, the one airline, communicates, particularly as little crises keep erupting. And hopefully they will do more of communication in anticipation. I reached out to Sanjay Lazar, CEO of Avialas Consultants and longtime Air India senior hand running in-flight operations and also having spent more than 32 years in the airline. I began by asking him how he was seeing the different aspects of airline operations come together and the challenges he foresaw. It's a momentous you know, day, that last week, day or last Thursday, you know, everything went through with the government and they gave the clearance. Going forward, I see the timetable is is pretty set in stone. Uh, 11th of November, they'll cut off Vistara. 12th of November onwards, you will be on an Air India flight number, but you could be on Vistara Metal with Vistara Co and Vistara uniforms and the logo. But it will take about six months for the transition to occur. So when I say transition, there are a couple of things. First, let's look aircraft. Now, gradually, all the 320s of on the Air India side will be retrofitted with the three-class configuration that Vistara has. That's a business premium and an economy. So I think by April, you should see at least 60 or 70 such aircraft. Okay, so that will homogenize the network operations for the domestic. The second thing you'll see is the merger of the frequent flyer programs which have already been announced but you'll get a big bang launch maybe 
in February or March next year with a new product, with new give it, you know, offerings, which will also include the Tata new products, the Tata, the palette of Tata, pro, you know, companies, you'll get a lot of benefits. So that's the sec second part. The third part now, when you speak of operations, very critical part, and there are going to be a lot of, you know, I won't say slip ups, but they're going to be many a slip between the cup and the lip here because people are used to a certain standard of service and customer attention in Vistara. And uh, that's for one reason, because if you've noticed, Vistara has its own counter staff. Air India does not have its own counter staff. Air India dispensed with their own counter staff some years ago when they hived off into Air India SATs and AIATSL, so they outsource. So there's a little, I mean, you have your management personnel there. There's a little difference. You'll notice the Air India counter staff wear orange or they wear the red. It's not an Air India uniform, it's a SATs uniform. AI SATs or the... So there's going to be slight difference there. You will see, but I think they're getting sensitized to how Tatas want their customer front-facing staff to behave. Uh, I, I'd say six months is tops that you'd see the slight disparity between the two in customer facing. Now, ground staff are being absorbed. The Vistara guy around staff, now you know that not all the Vistara staff are making it to Air India and not all the old Air India staff are making it to this merged company. There's been two VRS programs and there has been one voluntary separation scheme. There are quite a few people who have not made the cut and been told to go home. So you're going to see not all the staff coming in. As far as in-flight, now this is going to be the challenge uh, because everyone has acknowledged, whether you like it or not, that Vistara is a far superior in-flight service. It also has a brand new hard product, inter interiors, as well as aircraft. So that's going to be the challenge for you know the merged carrier. So what's going to happen? The Vistara crew are currently going to fly the Vistara aircraft and the Air India crew are flying. They've done what is called a bridge training. So the pilots and the cabin crew started bridge training in June of last year, of this year, sorry. So June, July, they started bridge training and they've been doing it progressively by November. Everybody in both the carriers would have done it. What is bridge training? Bridge training effectively synchronizes the training standards of one carrier with the other, the terminology, you know, SOPs, etc. So you, even though you have one manual, everybody recognizes what is going to be the defining procedure. So that's already been set in place. The fourth thing I believe is the training academy that they've set up, which has got uh, Sunil Baskaran as a, the head. That's going to be a massive training academy. It's already up and running. And I can see a lot of Singapore Airlines input into this because soft skills is something that, you know, over the years, Singapore has excelled in. They brought to the Vistara bouquet and then they made, you know, Vistara a redefined airline. So I think that's where you're going to see a lot of the people that have come in get trained. Now, one very important fact in the in-flight service, almost two and a half thousand of the old Air India staff have gone. So you're left with less than five, six, seven hundred cabin crew out of 8,000. So effectively what the Tatas have done, they've got their own people in or they've recruited fresh people whom they want to train and groom for the future. So it's almost as though they were starting a new Vistara in Air India. You know, the remaining six, seven hundred are really uh, seniors who will continue on, of course. But, you know, a drop in the ocean, it's not even 10%. So by and large, you're saying they've churned about seven and a half thousand people already? No, I'm saying they've churned two and a half thousand odd cabin crew and about four thousand odd ground, ground staff in both the carriers out. Yes, absolutely. So it's about six, seven thousand out of the two. Now, what is important? The entire top management is new. It's purely Tata or Singapore Airlines. Mind you, Singapore Airlines has been watching this from the, you know, from behind the scenes. And, and a lot of the people put in the plug in the holes are either Singapore Airlines tick mark or from that group of carriers or, you know, their adjacencies. Middle management is 70% new or 60% new. And the lower lung, they've recruited so many new people. We never had, Air India has never had 8,000 cabin crew. We've had two, three, four. Today you're going to, you're already at 275 aircraft in the merged four carriers, which are now two, and you're looking at going to 500 in the next two years. So you need 
over 10,000 cabin crew for this. So the, the time will come in a year or two where you will see absolutely brand new crew. I mean, I spent 37, 38 years there. Let me tell you, I fly today, I don't recognize a soul. So it's absolutely new faces with new outlook, with completely Tata, Vistara, Singapore Airlines training. That's how it's going to go forward. So there is going to be a little bit of, uh, I'd say, ripples in the water, but I don't see it to be too much of a problem. They will sail through within six months. Okay, so a couple of questions. So you're saying that the three-class configuration is what Air India will also adopt or adapt? Absolutely. It's already done. The first few aircraft are already done. Yes. So we will have a premium economy, business class and economy on all the 320 fleet. But you're saying that today, when at least for the next six months, as passengers or flyers book tickets, you could land up in any of these aircraft without knowing whether you're going to land up in any of these aircraft with... Whether it's an old... 320, well, there are no longer old 320s in Air India. They're all being moved or refurbished. So understand that. But you could land up very well, you know, booking an Air India on a flight number and on a Vistara aircraft or <laughs> book an Air India flight number and end up on an Air India aircraft. But be that as it may, domestically, on the trunk routes, you will get the three-class configuration. That you can be assured of. The older 320s are now going towards uh, Air India Express, Air Asia combined, and they're going to operate them on the secondary routes or, or Gulf routes or whatever they decide. So it's it's divided. Right. And Vistara had a whole bunch of international, both West and East, Singapore and Paris, Frankfurt. So how do you see those merging? or From the mid-winter cycle. Now, because Vistara will sunset by the 11th, 12th of November, I do not see Vistara flights being operated by Air India beyond a month or two after that, peak season. So I see maybe till end of Jan. The reason for that is the bookings may already have been done. You know, if you take a Bombay London or a Delhi London or a Bombay pa Delhi Paris or whatever. So I don't see more than two or three months for them to operate. They will have to surrender slots or decide which are more lucrative. It does not make sense if Vistara is getting a 60% load factor and Air India is getting a 75% load factor to operate two flights a day to the same station. You would then operate maybe one larger aircraft. That's about it. So it's going to be rationalized. They're in the plan. I think you'll really see the emergence of the merged carrier from next summer. The next summer schedule, March onwards, is when the effective changes will be implemented. You will see the rationalization of routes where they don't need to duplicate metal where they don't need to duplicate workforce. Very important. Very few people calculated this. But let's say in a city like Paris, Vistara had six flights, Air India had seven flights. You have a station, station manager for both. You have an airport manager. You have a duty manager. You have a counter support. You have everything replicated in London, where Air India operates you know, 30 flights and Vistara operates five, six flights a week. You have, you know, at two airports, you have multiple staff. So all that is going to come down. So there's going to be a rationalization of staff, of operations. Maybe there may be an increase of destinations, which is what I see. They will redeploy some Vistara capacity onto other areas. Vistara was woefully underutilized on the 787, and uh, its, its utilization was one of the worst across airlines. But I think with Air India coming into the picture and their pilots you know, now being able to cross-operate, you will see greater utilization there. So Air India will be able to fill in the gaps in international spaces where it doesn't have aircraft. Uh, remember, there is a huge shortage of aircrafts in the market. Boeing has hit a dead, you know, wall at you know on the triple seven, on the seven three seven. So Air India is getting hurt there. Air India is not getting enough Airbus in the market because Indigo is just gobbling them up every day. So this Vistara network is going to be hugely important for Air India. Thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Volkswagen slams the reverse gear. 
German car maker Volkswagen on Monday warned it will no longer be able to rule out plant closures in the country, saying it could embark on major cost-cutting measures in order to future-proof the company. Volkswagen Group CEO Oliver Bloom said in a statement reported by Bloomberg that the European automotive industry is in a very demanding and serious situation. According to him, the economic environment became even tougher as new competitors are entering the European market and in addition, Germany in particular as a manufacturing location is falling further behind in terms of competitiveness. As a result, Volkswagen Group must act decisively, he said. Volkswagen also said that brands within the company would need to undergo a comprehensive restructuring before adding that the current situation means that even plant closures at vehicle production and component sites can no longer be ruled out. The situation is extremely tense and cannot be resolved through simple cost-cutting measures, the Volkswagen CEO Thomas Schaffer said in a statement. It's not clear at this point what the India impact will be, but officials at Volkswagen said two months ago that they were in talks with a potential partner in India who would hold equity. This would happen under Volkswagen's subsidiary Skoda and Skoda India. And Volkswagen Group brands, by the way, in India also include, apart from Skoda, Volkswagen itself, Audi, Porsche and Lamborghini. That was The Core Report with me, Govindraj Ethiraj. Do stay connected with more of our coverage at The Core. You can check out our website or sign up to our newsletter for our exclusive stories, one in-depth feature a day on www.thecore.in. Do also track us on LinkedIn, where we usually post synopses or extracts of our top stories and interviews. We would love your feedback on how we can make business more interesting and relevant, including, of course, India's vibrant manufacturing sector. So write to us at feedback at the core.in. And thank you once again for listening.